everybody to the first of our Food Leader webinar series. Tonight we'll be doing an introduction to the series, talk about some of the issues we will be discussing. And I'd uh, just uh, like to introduce myself quickly. Uh, my name is Jason Matthias. I'm the founder of True Food Solutions, a husband and father, a lifelong gardener, a military veteran, and an entrepreneur. Uh, my, uh, my goal in this webinar series is to really have it be interactive and have it be as informative and inspirational to people as possible. So um, hopefully uh, seeing me with my kids and, uh, and the context of farming is somewhat inspirational to those who uh, either are farming or maybe desire that. Uh, if you're not, hopefully you, you like uh, good food. And um, that's not going to be all I'm going to be talking about, but it is a, a passion of mine. So uh, I want to include a couple pictures there as we get started. So let me tell you a little bit about True Food Solutions for those of you who may not be uh, familiar. Uh, it's an online community for real food enthusiasts, and it cover, pretty much covers the, ga the gambit. If you are interested in um, gardening, uh, in local food, uh, the local food economy, uh, in farming, uh, if you're a foodie who likes great food, uh, anybody who's interested in healthy eating, uh, if you're a homesteader or a food activist, uh, pretty much anything along those lines and more uh, is what the online community at True Food Solutions is uh, designed to facilitate interaction amongst. So uh, really we provide a venue for asking questions and sharing ideas with each other, uh, developing and implementing real solutions to reform the food system uh, in our nation and around the world in many cases that is just uh, broken and in need of uh, reform. Uh, really uh, when it comes down to it, it's about sharing and about learning. And that's where our uh, phrase, growing ideas together, comes from. It's really about you interacting with each other uh, and putting the knowledge and experience that you all have uh, to good use, not just in your, uh, your own family uh, or even just your local community, but try and facilitate the sharing of those solutions and um, best practices that you have around the country and around the world. And that's uh, the beauty of the Internet is that we can do that easily uh, across great boundaries uh, such as uh, time and space. So why a Food Leader Series? Well, the recent food conference in San Antonio a couple of weeks ago brought together a lot of great thought leaders to discuss issues of food. But there's a whole lot of other leaders uh, in this very broad and wide-ranging movement to reform our food system that need to be heard. And, uh, and that ranges from everybody from um, big names that you've heard of to people you've never heard of that are just out there doing the mundane and everyday tasks um, to make reformation possible and to, uh, to make a new and more sustainable system possible. So an informative uh, set of informative talks in, in questions and answers format is helpful for that uh, purpose, for educating uh, people and for implement, implementing reforms. And that's really what a, what a conference does uh, in large part. But a conference is short-lived, and often when people go home from a conference, they will, um, you know, if they don't make a purposeful effort to take what they've learned and implement it and keep in touch with people they met there and um, build relationships, uh, often the, the opportunity that exists in a conference can be lost. And so True Food Solutions is really, and has been for a couple of years now, an online community where people can uh, be able to interact with each other and have uh, similar types of sharing of of um, experiences and knowledge with each other like you would have at a conference but in an online setting um, so that you can be able to continue that kind of interaction. Um, whether you were at the conference or not, uh, you can continue that and, and have those kind of interactions on the website. So just a real quick overview of what the conference was about. Uh, the Reformation of Food in the Family Conference was hosted by a Vision Forum Ministries in San Antonio. It really was a groundbreaking event. Um, really talked about a whole wide range of issues, everything from uh, family culture and how food has been politicized to what the future of food in America looks like. Um, talks a lot, a lot about um, the culinary disciplines, uh, about frugality in terms of being able to feed your family on a budget, uh, the art of hospitality, and a whole bunch of other, of the other issues from farming to um, how to prepare uh, a meal on Sunday so that you're not overburdened and you can actually enjoy a day of rest. So, there really was a lot of great fellowship uh, with many like-minded people there. Uh, conference attendee uh, list was probably uh, between 13 and 1,500, I think. 
and uh, a lot of great inspiration from the speakers. And, and I really found um, from my own experience and talking with a lot of other people that stopped by our booth, you can see a picture there of our booth at the conference. When I asked people what was what's the best thing about the conference, you know, is it the, the, the speakers in general, a certain speaker, what you're learning, uh, or is it the interaction you're having, the fellowship you're having with other people? Most people said it really was the fellowship because it's the one thing that you can't get elsewhere. Uh, you know, you can listen to conference audio after the fact, but uh, interacting with people at the conference is a great benefit that you don't always get people assembled for a common purpose and with like-minded intentions. Uh, and so uh, you know, I use that as a segue to, to invite them to the True Feed Solutions community and to interact with each other on the website. So I, I encourage you to, um, to do so. Uh, this webinar series is intended to continue uh, not only the fellowship but also the inspiration aspect with having uh, great speakers sharing uh, their knowledge and, and insights with everyone. So appreciate you coming out. Um, just a quick question for those who are in attendance tonight on the webinar. How many people were at the food conference? Just uh, right, type in the chat box uh, yes. And uh, if you met me at the booth, um, also put in their booth as well. All right, I see a lot of familiar names. And remember a lot of these folks, I was uh, – Shiloh, I remember talking to you and Mandy, obviously um, Tony and John. Um, thanks for, uh, for coming by the booth and talking with us while we were there. Uh, Scott Terry, a good friend from New York, says, nope, I was milking cows. So um, yeah, it was, a, it was a great time. For those who weren't able to go, we'll talk um, in the uh, following days about how you might be able to, uh, to make up for some of that. So let's talk a bit about what is the problem. I mean, we, we, the, the name of, of uh, you know, the, the site is True Food Solutions, and it's an online community. That's great, but wh why do we need solutions? What are the solutions for? So uh, just a quick overview of what the problems are that we face um, in the Western and particularly the American food system. Um, you know, from the, from the source, you know, where our food is produced, we really have a petro farming system, an industrial farming system that for almost 60 years since around World War II has continually depleted the soil through artificial uh, chemical fertilizers. And uh, I call it petro farming not only because petrochemical fertilizers are used, but because the food is often produced uh, of long distance from where it's consumed, and so it ends up being transported long distances. So without uh, cheap oil, uh, and the transportation system that we have, the, the kind of food that people are used to today would not really be possible, and particularly the, the issue of having basically um, uh, food that is irrespective of seasons, right? There's no seasons in the, in the grocery store for the most part, other than potentially the actual ripeness of the, of the produce. But you know, in, in the winter, you can get fresh produce from South America because it's shipped. So um, that's not normal. That's a modern uh, uh, anomaly really and a phenomenon that, that people are used to these days but, but haven't existed in the past. Uh, to a large extent, that system uh, is um, supported and, and really was uh, given the um, shot in the arm back in the World War II area uh, by government subsidies and government uh, industry uh, favoring uh, Joel Salton had a great talk at the conference about the history of agricultural technology and how uh, the industrial farming system was largely jump-started as a result of the war-making industry producing lots of bombs and explosives. And after the war was over, they needed a place to put all that uh, manufacturing capacity to use. So they put it into chemical fertilizers and uh, found a market in the, in the farming uh, industry. Uh, in part because of government subsidies distorting the market and, and also because of other cultural shifts, family farming has really been devastated. Uh, and we now have in America, uh, if I remember correctly, Joel Salton's um, quote on it is, uh, you know, the average age of the American farmer is something like 65 years old, and the average age of the dairy, uh, average dairy farmer in America is up around 75. So basically most of the farmers in America are um, – you know, baby boom generation or older, and uh, in many cases because of cultural um, shifts, their children are not taking over the farms. So farms are often basically dying out or they're being consolidated into larger agribusiness farms. Uh, and that is, is 
in large extent to the fact that government subsidies have encouraged that in a lot of ways. Uh, we also have a transition from eating real food to consuming food products uh, created in factories, uh, and that really has led to an epidemic of disease of all kinds, whether it's heart disease, um, diabetes, um, obesity, all kinds of things are caused by, at their root really, in uh, diet and health and uh, diet environment and uh, lifestyle type changes. And a lot of that has to do with the changes in American um, culture and lifestyle uh, since the World War II with appliances, with the automobile and such. But realize that, that uh, largely those changes in the way we eat um, were made out of convenience and not necessarily made out of um, health being a priority. So um, because of that change to convenience in large part, Americans and, and others in the West, um, I wouldn't say Europe necessarily, but especially in America, we've changed to largely being producer, uh, we've changed from, from being produce, producers of food uh, one or two generations ago to being consumers only. Um, the vast majority of Americans are just consumers. They go and they buy all their food. They don't produce any of their food. Uh, and the vast majority of food that is purchased is it purchased through the industrial farming and distribution system, not through the local uh, farming system, although there is a rays of light and that is changing. Um, so those are some of the problems that we face. And so what ultimately uh, are the solutions? Uh, well, the simple answer is we are the solution. And we need to be leaders uh, in our own spheres of influence. So regardless of how much you read, how much you practice uh, good health, um, you know, gardening, buying from local farmers, you need to be a leader uh, in, in the spheres of influence that you're given. Uh, first, you need to lead yourself. You need to lead your family in making healthy decisions and, and trying to be uh, you know, more of a producer and not just a consumer. Um, being a leader to your friends and influencing them and talking about many of these issues and the changes that you and your family have made. And then also to your community. And the community there goes everything from you know, your town, uh, your church uh, congregation maybe, to um, your extended community, which now through social networking becomes much, much broader. You can be connected with people all over the world. And so uh, you know, things like Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn have really um, facilitated that. But there's a lot of people that don't use uh, social networking, or at least they don't use the one that most people use, which is Facebook. So um, there is still a gap for a way for people to connect with those outside of their local area, and that's one of the gaps that I'm, I'm trying to um, provide through True Food Solutions is a community, an online community where people can connect with each other, um, but in a focused, targeted um, area of topics and not, uh, you know, you don't necessarily have to, to be distracted by all, those, all the other stuff that's on Facebook and Twitter. Um, you can really just focus on, on things you're interested in like, um, real food and how to, how to obtain it and how to um, prepare it for your family. So in the end, a real reformation of our food system, uh, and it, if you want to call it a revolution uh, back to the old paths, uh, which were mo more sustainable, it will not happen unless uh, there's leadership exercised. And ultimately it's going to happen at the, um, the lower um, echelons. It's going to happen at the local level. Um, as much as we love reading uh, books about Joel Salton um, and Michael Pollan and hearing Joel speak, he's a great speaker, if people don't implement the things that they're talking about uh, at the local level and encourage others to do so, uh, the Reformation is not going to be um, facilitated in, in the t kind of timeliness that needs to happen. Uh, so that is one thing that we're trying to do with True Food Solutions to facilitate that. So, Speaking of leadership, what is a food leader? Ultimately, action is what distinguishes leaders. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt in 1910 giving a speech in, in France in Paris um, called a citizenship in a republic uh, said a very famous quote. He said, the credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs and comes short again and again, because there is not effort without errors and shortcomings but who actually does strive to do the deed, who knows the great enthusiasm, the great devotion, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least he fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. 
So I love that quote for, for many reasons, and ultimately I think that uh, what it speaks to is the fact that uh, you will never know victory or defeat uh, unless you try. And ultimately uh, being a leader and making things change for the better uh, requires action. So uh, you need to be a leader. You need to be a food leader because you are the solution. And we collectively are the solution uh, to making changes that need to happen in order to ensure that our children and our grandchildren uh, will grow up in uh, a society and a culture uh, that is not um, completely ridden with epidemic disease and who has fruit freedom and cho choice of what you eat. Uh, those kind of things are going to be um, made possible by the actions of people like you. So I appreciate you coming on this call, this webinar, and hopefully you'll be with us for other se uh, sessions in the series um, to learn more about what you can do um, locally in your area and in your spheres of influence. So to give you a little preview um, and to provide some inspiration about uh, you know, the, the subjects and the people we're going to be talking to, I uh, just want to go over real quick the lineup of some of the leaders we're inviting to this series. Not all these are scheduled or confirmed yet, but we are going to be talking to uh, many of the following leaders. Obviously one I've already mentioned, Joel Salatin. He's a third generation farmer, a sustainable farming pioneer, uh, an author and, and speaker. He's written eight books, his most recent of which is called Folks, This Ain't Normal. Uh, it's actually his first book uh, that is not self-published uh, and should uh, get very, very wide distribution. Um, I highly recommend that you read uh, that book, which is a great overview of a lot of the topics we'll be discussing in this series. And uh, you know, if you've never heard Joel speak, I highly recommend uh, taking a look for some of the audio. You can actually listen to the audio of one of his speeches, um, which is posted uh, on the blog on the True Food Solutions website. Um, if you're interested in that, just reply to one of these emails, and I'll be happy to uh, point you to that. But um, Joel's a, a very entertaining speaker. He's really kind of a Jeffersonian farmer philosopher, and uh, you know he speaks with a lot of wit and. Um, has some of the most wide-ranging vocabulary anybody you'll ever hear. So I uh, highly encourage you to um, look forward to when we can get him scheduled. I did speak to him at the conference, and uh, he said he was interested in um, in uh, joining us. So I look forward to getting him on the schedule. Although he is a very uh, a very busy speaker, hopefully uh, without needing to travel, he'll be able to join us in the near future. Also, uh, Doug Phillips, uh, who's the president of Vision Forum Ministries and is, uh, you know, was the sponsor of the Reformation of Food and Family Conference. He was one of the speakers there, gave some very inspiring keynote addresses on how we should look at food, um, both from a practical as well as a biblical perspective. And um, I did talk to Doug at the conference as well, and uh, he expressed his interest in, um, in talking with us, so we look forward to getting him uh, scheduled sometime in the near future. And um, hopefully uh, you'll be able to join us for, for that one as well. Uh, an interesting lady is Marjorie Wildcraft who is from Central Texas. Uh, for those of you who haven't heard about her DVD series she produced, um, her, her background really is in, as a homesteader and a gardener, and she took what she's learned over uh, more than a decade of building her homestead and uh, produced a, a DVD series uh, called Backyard Food Production. Um, also was recently renamed re, uh, Grow Your Own Groceries. But it's probably one of the best um, how-to DVD uh, video uh, resources that I've found for uh, small-scale uh, backyard or small farm pr food production, including everything from um, you know, managing water resources to building fertility in the soil, um, raising small game, uh, including chickens and rabbits and, and, and such, and really has a good a balanced perspective, everything from um, trying to maximize the fertility of the farm and yet how to build community with others in your area for bartering and such. So a lot of great resources. She's a very busy la lady speaking as well. Uh, she was just, uh, I think, two, uh, two weekends ago was at the um, uh, at a big expo in Dallas, I forget the name of it, but I think it was, uh, it was like a survivalism or um, uh, prepper uh, type uh, expo. And um, she's, I think, if I remember correctly, I think she's had sold over 200,000 uh, copies of this DVD series. So um, a great resource. I'd highly encourage you to take a look at it. But look forward to talking to, to Marjorie as well. Uh, Renee DeGroote is a good friend. She uh, blogs at culinaryreformation.com. 
and she's the author of uh, Health for Godly Generations, which is a um, Christian pers- and biblical perspective on health and nutrition, um, among many other things. Uh, she is uh, a uh, local leader in her Western, the local Western Price uh, chapter in her native Montana, and uh, she's also getting ready to go to uh, culinary school, and uh, we'll be blogging from her uh, experiences there. Uh, we, um, we'll be talking just a little bit later about having Renee on the program uh, for an upcoming webinar, so uh, look for more on that. Gary Powers was one of the speakers at the food conference. He's the CEO of Orthomolecular Products, and uh, that is a leading nutritional supplement producer. Uh, he's also a father uh, of 10 children. Uh, he's also an elder in his local church, and uh, he had a lot of great things to say, a lot of inspirational, big picture, as well as uh, practical perspective type uh, insights to lend, and we look forward to having Gary on uh, when we can get him scheduled. i uh, talk to him briefly when he stopped by our booth, and he's a very nice man. look forward to speaking with him. Peter Bringy is a young man, but uh, is uh, already the author of a great little book called The Christian Philosophy of Food, looking at the various aspects of food um, from a theological perspective, cultural perspectives, um, uh, family economy, and other areas. Uh, it's a great read, and it's gotten a lot of good feedback. He was at the conference uh, uh, next to us, uh, at a booth next to us at the conference. We got to spend some time with Peter, and I highly recommend his book as well to get um, some good um, you know, theological and biblical primers on um, how to uh, treat food from a wide range of different uh, types of perspectives. Uh, I've also talked with Kristen Canty, who's a small farm advocate. She's a mom of four up in Massachusetts. And uh, as she started buying from local farmers, she uh, started learning about a lot of the persecution uh, and assaults on food freedom that were happening uh, against small farmers uh, that she uh, had interactions with. So she ended up making a film. She had never made a film before, but she made a film that was recently released called Farmageddon. Uh, which is a uh, really eye-opening documentary talking about the assault on small family farms uh, and the threats to food freedom. Uh, so look forward to having uh, Christy on, uh, I'm sorry, Kristen on the program sometime in the near future. And highly recommend that documentary uh, if you haven't already seen it. Uh, another uh, young man that we look forward to having on the program is uh, Noah Sanders, who is a homesteader and a farmer. Uh, started farming a few years back. Uh, has done a great job of uh, applying um, his faith to the activity on his farm and his family. Um, he's been blogging at redeemingthedirt.com and has a lot of great uh, insights to share there. And his recently released book called Born Again Dirt is just a fantastic um, look at uh, what the Bible says about food and agriculture um, from the perspective of being a producer of food. And he has a lot of uh, good applications and practical insight to uh, what it's like to go about uh, starting a family farm and um, how, what kind of mindset you need to have to make it work. So it talks about everything from kind of you know, um, scaling a farm venture, uh, and he, his farm is mostly doing uh, produce farming, but he also raises some pasture broilers and starting to do some other animals as well. But you know, how to go from producing your own food to starting to produce additional food to take to market. Uh, so his perspective, I think, is very applicable to a lot of the people that um, are already growing some of their own food and uh, want to potentially start producing excess to take to market or to sell to their friends and neighbors. Um, and that is, uh, I think, one of the key solutions we need to be facilitating um, you know, across the country. And so uh, Noah has done a fantastic job in his book of going over a lot of those concepts and um, how he's applied them in his farm. Uh, he's a, uh, a young man recently married um, just uh, less than two years ago, and they have a little baby. Um, they were also at the conference, and he was one of the speakers at the conference. So got to spend some time uh, talking with Noah some more and his family who were there helping um, display his book in the uh, vendor hall. And uh, he had just really, really good feedback from all the folks that went to his session. So look forward to having Noah on as well. So I'd like to know now who else you want to hear. So uh, go ahead and type into the chat box any other authors, speakers, um, or friends and, and family you may have. It doesn't necessarily have to be somebody who's famous or who's written a book or who's a speaker. Um, if you know a farmer who's doing great things or somebody who's uh, you know, running a community garden in your area, um, put, a, uh, put a name down in the box and I'd love to, uh, to hear what you have for your ideas. 
Um, Ian from New York um, has a great one. Franklin Sanders, uh, I definitely have to get him on the list. Also have uh, Herrick Kimball listed by James. Uh, Mike Brabo I've already got on my tentative list, so thank you, Tony. Uh, uh, actually, some of the attendees tonight I'm planning on have, having on. Scott Terry in New York, I'm planning on asking him to come on at some point. He was gracious enough to have me on his uh, Christian Farm and Homesteader radio program, online radio program a couple weeks ago, uh, maybe a month ago now, and that was a great time. Um, if anybody else has any other suggestions, just go ahead and type it in the chat box, even if it's later in the presentation. I'd love to get any feedback you have. Um, and I'll be following up with everybody after the, uh, the webinar as well to get more feedback via email uh, and the website. So look forward to hearing your inputs there. Um, the sooner that we get ideas, the sooner we can start coordinating and, and getting people on the program. I don't really have a defined length for this series, but I do anticipate it going uh, weekly for at least a couple months perhaps more, uh, though the frequency might change. I like to have it be an ongoing series where we can uh, invite people on to have discussions, talk about what they're doing, um, have Q&A, and have everybody uh, you know, just be a, real, um, a really good interactive, informative uh, resource that people can have. And um, we are just, you know, I am recording this, and uh, we'll be making it available later, so uh, if you'd like to share it with somebody or can't make a future session, don't worry. Uh, they'll be made available. Uh, so you can watch the video or download the audio if you want to put it on your, uh, your iPod or something while you're on the go. You can do that as well. So uh, thanks for your input there. So we've reached the time for questions. I have a couple things at the end to wrap up with, but I just want to ask, uh, what are your questions? What are the, um, the issues that you're working on? Uh, that you know, you'd like to bring up that we can maybe just chat about a bit tonight. But I really just want this to be an interactive forum for people to, uh, to, to let us know, you know what they have um, going on, what things they're learning, uh, what questions you have, because uh, we really want it to be uh, this, this format to be very interactive. So please uh, either type in the chat box a question you might have, uh, or if you would like to ask it on the line, um, just type in the chat box. I have a, a verbal question, and I'll go ahead and unmute the line, and we can let you uh, ask it verbally. We're continuing to get some great uh, input on speakers. Uh, Dr. Bernoulli from the Food Conference. Uh, I've, my wife had a lot of great things to say about him in the sessions she attended. And uh, somebody else mentioned uh, mentioned that as well. Uh, Tony mentioned Howard King. If we could ever find him, that's funny. Uh, Sarah brings up, a, uh, I guess, an, an interest area, um, maybe more than a question. She says, I'd like to know more about food allergies, why we have them, and how to minimize them. There actually was a session at the food conference about food allergies. So I will track down who the speaker was on that and uh, see if maybe we can get them on the program. You know, one uh, one thing I just thought of. Um, thanks, Renee. Uh, Renee DeGroot mentioned that uh, Dr. Frisch from Missouri spoke about allergies, and um, I actually had him on my list. I didn't list him in the the slides, but uh, I did have him on my list too as one of the conference speakers to follow up with. So um, I'll look at getting him. Um, one thing I just I, I'm curious: has anybody? I didn't mention it already, but has anybody seen the film? Um, I'm blanking on the. Uh, I remember the title now. It's called Food Matters. Has anybody seen the film Food Matters? Okay, we're getting a few people saying yes. Um, some of the speakers in that film I thought were very, very informative, uh, talking about nutrition, chronic disease. Uh, Mrs. Gerson from the Gerson Institute was one of them. So I'm not sure if we can get all of them on, but if you have heard interviews with other people or seen any documentaries that had good speakers, that might be another source for other good speakers we can try to have on the program. Charlotte Gerson would be great, Jocelyn says. That would be great. 
Um, again, I don't know how many of these people do uh, do you know these kind of interviews. So um, if we can't do a live interview via webinar, what we'll probably try to do is do a written interview, maybe via email or something, and we can put that on the blog. So that might be a a way that we can uh, still access those people in a way that's maybe more accessible for them. Uh, Christy, good to see you on the on the program. Uh, Dr. Natasha Campbell McBride, can you mention? I, I recognize the name, but I don't know the um, connection. Can you just chat real quickly what that? Um, oh, Gaps Diet, great. Yeah, I've got several people I know that are doing Gaps and have had great results. So that's good. Thanks for that uh, that recommendation as well. Okay, does anybody have any um, specific questions that you want to bring up? Um, I'm happy to actually open up uh, the uh, the line for anybody that wants to you know verbally answer other questions. Again, I want this to be interactive. So if you have any questions, please uh, please throw them out there. Thanks, Renee, for that uh, mention of the Real Food Summit. I did uh, take a quick look at that. It looks like they had some good good speakers there as well. Does anybody have any questions on? What we discussed tonight. Uh, again, this is kind of an overview, but um, either questions or thoughts on what the um, the problems are that we're facing and what some of the solutions are, because uh, that will, you know, depending upon what interest is expressed, that will help uh, help me establish priorities for which speakers we get out, which topics we cover first, those kind of things. Scott mentions uh, Christy Arendt would be a great one to have on. I agree. I did have her on my list as well. Renee uh, makes it a, a, a great question. What are the different ways uh, to be a, a food leader? And I'm actually going to hit on the hi a highlighted answer to that. So I'll save the answer to that for a minute because I actually have a slide that kind of speaks to that. Um, but I would like to actually have uh, in general, this webinar series to be uh, a exemplification of how you can be a food leader. So, uh, again, this is not just you know famous people or famous speakers or even just thought leaders. Um, I'm going to have on people farmers like um, Scott Terry and Mike Bravo, people that we know. Um, going to have on um, people who are implementing GAPS and other uh, nutritional and dietary changes and what they've found. Um, those kind of things, you know, just normal people because ultimately that's what we're trying to facilitate with True Food Solutions is sharing what you're doing and um, other people learning from that and trying to accelerate the learning and implementation of solutions to, to get people further down the road quicker, um, to get people inspired to take more leadership in their local area and get other people uh, excited about um, you know, making change. Uh, locally and through relationships with other people. So those are the kind of things we're looking to uh, to facilitate. Uh, James Berry uh, asked a good question. How how uh, what's a good way to get more community support for local farmers markets and CSAs? Um, if uh, anybody that's on the uh, the webinar would like to answer that verbally and it's on called in on the phone line. Please just chat. Uh, I'd like to answer verbally, and I'll go ahead and open it up so you can answer. Because I actually like to get others' perspective uh, for that, if anybody is uh, willing to answer. Okay. I think we might. We, I think we have some folks that are can probably answer, but they may be listening on the uh, streaming audio, so they probably can't speak to it. Um, if you have any answers to that question that you'd just like to put in the chat box, so go free. Feel free to put that in there. Um, I'll, I'll um, mention a few here in a sec, but I'm trying to get some uh, interactive participation. I wish uh, Mike Bravo was on the line tonight because he uh, runs the CSA and has a lot of uh, I think lessons learned from doing it that way. Do you have anybody on the line tonight that is um, has been a uh, vendor at a farmers market, whether that's you know you're a farmer and you're selling produce, or you know you make some kind of a homemade product like goat milk soap or something else that you um, would like to share your insights about a farmers market in particular?
Uh, Ian and Adam, some good ideas. Um, are, are any of you who just answered yes? Um, I'm going to go ahead and open up the conference line, and I will call on one of you if you're on, then you can go ahead and share your insights. Let me uh, unmute the line here. You are now unmuted. Okay, if anybody has both the phone audio and the streaming audio on, please turn off the streaming audio so we don't get feedback. Um, Ian, since you're the first to answer yes, why don't you give us some insights on um, local farmers markets and similar vendors for or similar venues for um, you know, getting community participation. Just as a way of introduction, Ian Lamont, a good friend up in New York, um, has made a uh, he's an entrepreneur who's made a business out of selling a homemade um, chocolate uh, fudge sauce, which is fantastic, um, and does uh, local events all over uh, the New England area um, to promote and sell his products. So, Ian, do you have a, a few thoughts you want to share? Um, I guess this is one of the dangers of being one of the first ones to reply. So, <laughs> um, I, we've been involved with the farmers market for a number of years, and it's been interesting to see how our dependency on a, um, a largely vacationer population has you know, fluctuated over the years, and it's generally been very strong. But what we're running into now is how to um, keep that up as the economy wanes and we're having fewer people come up for vacation around this area. Um, so one of the things that I've been involved with locally is getting involved with the Chamber of Commerce. Um, farms are businesses, but oftentimes the business community doesn't necessarily see them that way, um, but would be interested in having members if they just were thinking in a different paradigm. And it's not like it's that difficult, it just it has to occur to them somehow. So possibly approaching chambers of commerce to either start more farmers markets or put that extra support behind the farmers market. I think there's a lot of resources to be tapped into in these small town or bigger town chambers of commerce. Great. Thank you Ian for that's that one, insight. That's one I have. Yeah, and you you've got a particular challenge in that your your product is somewhat of a of a premium uh, upper end kind of disposable income type product. So it's a, it's a little bit of a different uh, product than say you know a produce farmer who's selling you know you know tomatoes and peppers, sure. which is more of a staple. Yeah. Right. Um, I guess what I was referring to though is even because our farmers market is largely dependent on vacationers, we're trying to meet, we need to find ways to get the local population to be interested in buying local food. So it's not just sure. It's just attendance at the farmer's market to begin with. So that's, that's one of the issues that we've needed to confront. Sure. So um, in your interactions with the Chamber of Commerce, have you, I, I'm, I'm guessing this is kind of a dual purpose, that you're, you're both trying to encourage them to, um, the business community to support the farmer's market, but also just local food in general, whatever the sales channel may be. Exactly. Okay, that's great. And then, and then encouraging farmers to recognize um, the local community as a marketplace and not just a bigger city. You know, try, everyone tries to go down to New York City to sell. There are a lot of people around here that would be interested, but they, they're not necessarily aware that somebody's raising turkeys or that somebody's got. Um, you know, potatoes for sale, you know, that, that type of thing. Right, so that's great. Marketing in your smaller area. That's great. Well, thank you, uh, Ian, for those insights. Um, Adam, are you on the line? Can you, uh, can you speak? Hey, Jason. Yeah, I'm on. Hey, Adam. Let me give you a quick intro um, just so you'll know. Adam Sheridan is down in uh, northern Georgia. He is a uh, an entrepreneur as well, and uh, he is working on various things. But uh, his primary effort is uh, the past couple, past few years is uh, launching a startup um, effort of sorts, which is a um, small farm aggregator uh, to encourage and give opportunity to family farmers uh, to have an outlet for their uh, their produce. And they're focusing on grape tomatoes, and uh, Adam handles. Um, the production coordination as well as the distribution uh, to primarily the Atlanta market, but works with um, uh, grocery chains, uh, Whole Foods, 
as well as distributors. So uh, with that intro, Adam, if you could just give us uh, some insights. Well, Jason, I am not a big fan of the farmer's market model uh, from a business perspective simply because the amount of time that one has to invest uh, in the markets is, is pretty high. I work with several growers who are in uh, our major regional farmers markets and the um, typical grower ends up spending uh, about <clears throat> six hours on a Saturday and if they need to expand beyond just a couple of acres of production, uh, now they're having to go to multiple markets and try to cover several markets uh, every week. And uh, it is a there's no guaranteed sale. There's uh, no guaranteed uh, traffic count. So it it has a lot of flaws. It, it's a there are definitely some things about it. In the, in the fact that you can get to know individual vendors uh, kind of from a consumer standpoint, and it also is a, it's inherently uh, local, uh, but there are some things that one has to consider from a, just the, the time standpoint uh, in looking at that farmer's market model. I certainly don't think it should be a primary or, or a uh, sole way of uh, selling products. Great. Well, thanks, Adam. I, um, Adam's, uh, I think, insights are particularly important because, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Adam, but it, still, isn't it like 80% uh, of organic, uh, at least certified organic, um, produce and food is still sold in the grocery stores? Yeah, that's right. It's, um, I wish I had the numbers in front of me, but the, the market share is substantially lopsided. Uh, towards the wholesale distribution model, and so really that's where the potential is. Uh, my thought and my uh, forecast is that we'll see farmers markets over the next five years more or less saturated, uh, especially in the urban areas, and uh, with the the interest in farming and the low barriers to entry to farmers markets, uh, I think that. What's going to end up happening is that farmers are going to have less and less uh, opportunities to sell there at markets. I don't think that the uh, number of consumers is going to increase drastically, but I see the supply side increasing uh, pretty heavily, and I think that that's going to leave a lot of farmers potentially with uh, with less market uh, less market share, obviously, but also less uh, potential sales. Right. Yeah, I was just at our farmers market this past weekend, and uh, one of the things that immediately jumped out at me was the fact that you know when you get, when you're a farmer going to a farmers market, you're basically putting yourself in front of the customer in the direct vicinity of all your com competition. So um, there's actually a lot of downsides for the farmer from the farmer to, to go to the farmers market. Yeah, people go there and they can find you, but at the same time, there are downsides like um, you know, there's immediately uh, very visible competition. Um, it takes a lot of your time, those kind of things. So um, I agree that uh, in addition to other options like being able to sell into um, the you know, modern distribution system, that things like CSAs, like direct to the consumer um, through online sales and those kind of things are other opportunities that uh, need to be looked at as well. I think one way that farmers really can distinguish themselves is by really connecting with their customers. Part of that I think is um, sharing their story and making the customer feel like they're a part of it. I think it's one of the things that a CSA does, uh, and for those who may not know, a CSA stands for Community Supported Agriculture. It's basically a share-based program where the customer um, buys a share in the farm production for that year. So it's a, one of the best things about it is that it, it allows the customer to share some of the risk with the farm. Uh, and have uh, really more of a direct connection with the farm. And so um, I think it, there's, there's other downsides to it, and we can talk about those another time with people that have done it, uh, folks like uh, Mike Bravo and others. But um, I think that you know, anybody who is farming or is looking at farming, as well as on the consumer end, you should look at all your options and don't just, 
don't just settle for one channel if that is uh, the farmer's market. Yeah, it's great to go to the farmer's market, but you know, go visit the farms too. Go and check out your farmers in your local area. Go look at, at what their, their operation looks like. Talk with them about um, their production techniques and all that. Uh, you know, you're much more likely to be able to trust um, the product that you're getting um, by seeing the farm and knowing the farmer and talking to the farmer than you are through any uh, US duh label that's slapped on it, as Joel Salen likes to call it. Uh, you know, the the certifi certification is great, but um, it doesn't necessarily uh, get you the highest quality. Often, knowing the farm and knowing the, the actual production um, techniques and um, and um, environment uh, it can can you know, certify that for you with with firsthand knowledge. So, I recommend um, doing that as well. Uh, let me see here. I think that's a good on that. Um, Topic. Unless somebody else had a, another question or a follow-up on the question of farmers markets and CSAs in terms of encouraging community interaction for them, somebody else have any thoughts that's on the line? Just go ahead and speak up. Uh, Jason, can you hear us? Yes. Who's that? Uh, this is this is John Roberts. Um, my brother Hi, John. And are, are, hey, how you doing? Um, my Good, brother here with me. He he's gonna he's gonna ask the question. Basically, um, my name is Jared Roberts. I run a small um, small Fibonacci garden. We are selling to a few people. Um, I have been uh, thinking and reading a lot about this since um, my late teen years. Um, Basically, my question is, what what type of things are we doing? Because really, we have nailed down the farming side, and we've expanded into places like Market Garden, or, or, or I'm sorry, into um, farmers. farmers markets. Um, what are we doing to expand into the larger network um, restaurants? We don't really have no. This is where the trade-off comes with production cost versus um, profits, because as soon as you add middlemen. Then um, they want to take their pennies off the top. Um, but what are we doing? Because um, I, I, I kind of feel like this is really where the next stage needs to go if we're going to pursue food um, localization, but but expanding to the point where we can be sustainable, where the whole community know that their food is coming from local sources, even the restaurants, even the the cafeterias. Everything. Um, anybody? Anybody comment on that? Um, thanks for that question, Jared and John. That's uh, that's great. Uh, I wish that we had um, Mike on the line because I think he's done some of that. But is there anybody else that is uh, a farmer who's actually selling to local restaurants and other opportunities that are not uh, consumer type channels? Does anybody? Uh, if you do, just type in the chat box. Uh, Kind of raise your hand and say, "I've got an answer," and I'll go ahead and call on you. I think that the other farmers we have on the line, maybe Adam Sheridan. I don't know how if he's gotten any into um, restaurant sales. I think most of it has been more for the consumer market. Adam, do you have any thoughts on that? You might be the one that's closest to that that uh, that market and, and have some idea. We do work with several growers who go direct to restaurants, and that's actually a – I like that avenue uh, because it's a little more predictable uh, as far as restaurant volumes and demand. And uh, they're also uh, – you can really uh, – you build a good relationship with a restaurant, and it, as things get worse regarding uh, regulatory environment, uh, I think that's a potential outlet where you can sort of slide under the radar uh, for a farmer to still be able to sell their product without all of the certifications and uh, the requirements that are probably going to be placed on us in the near future. Um, and it, it does seem to be worthwhile. The, the Probably the main issue there is, again, uh, what is the market size? And, and it depends a lot on where you live. 
as to whether or not you're going to be dealing with restaurants who, who really care about local. So many of them get their stuff from Cisco, and it, uh, it comes on a truck, and it's easy, and it's cheap, and they're not really all that interested in working with uh, a farmer who may be a little bit inconsistent, uh, whose products may not be available in March versus July. Uh, but those who are on board philosophically, it does seem to work pretty well uh, for the growers who are doing that. Thanks, Adam. I think that's some great insights. A couple of things that I thought of while Adam was speaking that um, just are some thoughts on uh, for for you, Jared and John, as you're looking to how to where to take your your uh, you know market garden venture. Uh, I think with um, you're just kind of analyzing the the market space uh, when you're looking at restaurants, uh, as as Adam alluded to. You know, you're you're depending on you have to you have to find the right market niche because if you're trying to compete against Cisco, you're probably not going to win because they don't care about quality or variety of the produce in terms of the actual you know if it's heirloom or or whatever. If they, if they don't care about that, they're not not going to want to pay pay the premium. However, if you find the right restaurants who care about having unique uh, uh, produce and unique ingredients for their um, for their food in the restaurant, um, you may very well be able to, um, you know, adjust your production or adjust your um, the makeup of your your crops to meet that demand. Um, so, looking at you know kind of unique types of crops to raise. Um, even things that are not necessarily um, what we normally think of as market gardening, but things like you know um, growing mushrooms. Uh, if you have any kind of uh, woods, you can become a mushroom farmer. In fact, it's one of the best ways to monetize a forest <laughs> is by um, growing growing mushrooms. So you know if there's a market for it, grow shiitake mushrooms uh, and you know take those to market. Um, also, as Adam mentioned, the the seasonality issue is going to be an issue for um, restaurant buyers, and so the ability to grow off season is going to increase the chances that you're going to be able to land a contract with a restaurant if you can get be the first ones producing greens in uh, late uh, late winter or something because you've got a greenhouse or something. And I know you guys are working on a greenhouse, so that's uh, one reason I'm saying this. That can be an, an additional distinguishing factor. So part of this is you have to think of the 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 market you're pursuing, and say so you're changing it from a, a business to consumer relationship where you're going after the consumer and and they have a, their own set of desires, to a business to business relationship. They have some other additional considerations. Um, one of those is going to be um, predictability, like Adam said. Another one's going to be uniqueness of what you can bring them and when you can bring it to them. So if you can bring them um, unique products off season, that can often distinguish you in being able to land a contract with them to provide even stuff that's in season because they'd rather buy just from you than from a bunch of different producers potentially. So just some additional thoughts uh, kind of from more of an entrepreneur's perspective about you know, how to access that market. And we can talk more later. Uh, maybe a good session to actually have um, focused on farmers and particularly uh, you know, farmers trying to look at the different sales channels they have and w what are the different characteristics of the different ones and how do you go after those different ones. I'd love to have a conversation about that um, and maybe we can um, you know, put together a uh, multiple um, speaker series on that as well if there's enough demand. So um, great, uh, great questions, great input. Did you have any follow-ups, um, Jared, that you wanted to ask about that, that issue? Um. No, no, really just looking at, you know, I, I would love to see you guys do a session on um, just that whole access to that market. Um, that would be great. I, it, that's really a, an interest of mine. So, Good, good. I, I think that, you know, um, your ability to weather uh, a shock of any sort, um, in particularly from on the demand side uh, as a farmer, um, it, diversification is important. Just like in investing, it's important to diversify. Um, if you have the ability to diversify your customer base, uh, as long as it doesn't add extra cost in terms of uh, distribution and all those other kind of things. Um, one of the great things about selling to restaurants is you're going to have higher volume sales with less customers. So you actually cut down on your, um, 
distribution costs uh, potentially because you're just selling to a lot, a lot more more frequently to that one customer versus the same kind of volume you'd have to do with the consumer base is going to be multiplied by many times the number of customers, right? And so there's a certain transaction cost that goes with all of those that you can um, eliminate when you do a um, you know, restaurant type. Um, or even uh, another kind of type of uh, another, another ch sales channel that would be kind of like a restaurant would be something like a food co-op or buying club where they're buying a bunch from you to um, distribute themselves to various members in their group. So kind of like a CSA, but not necessarily um, where you're administering it. If you can find a buying club to, to sell to you, that could be uh, one way you could increase your volume a lot um, and without necessarily increasing your transaction uh, cost. So. All right, that was a great discussion. That's the kind of thing I really want to see here is uh, sharing of insights and um, even just t what kind of topics should we be covering? Because there's some of these things that you know would be great to have um, a, you know blog series on or something like that, where we kind of give a very specific subject a, a good thorough treatment. I may not necessarily be lent to having a whole webinar on it, but we can actually uh, talk about those things uh, in uh, the group forums or in blog posts and those kind of things. So. Um, Amy asks, or, or says, she'd love to see a session on raising animals according to good stewardship principles. Um, and the chat is scrolling very quickly here. Uh, yeah, and it, so like basically, you know, a lot of the animal meat products um, that are available today are big agriculture, industrial, factory farming. So, um, what does raising animals according to good principles look like? And so that's a that's a great um, great question, uh, and we will obviously uh, if we can get Joel Salton on in the near future. Um, a lot of I mean his his business is he's an animal farmer. I mean they they have a garden and stuff too to to feed the family and the and the interns and their whole operation. But their main uh, products for market are meat uh, through animal farming. In fact, it's kind of funny if you ask Joel what kind of farmer he is, he tell, he tells everybody he's a, he's a grass farmer. It's just that he's using the animals to build the grass, which feed the animals. So um, I love that. In fact, here's a here's a thought for you. Um, most Americans are grass farmers, but they do nothing with the harvest except cut it with a machine that's burning gas and oil to do so. Um, so you know, I'm a big proponent of very decentralized solutions, and ultimately, uh, the most decentralized solution is growing your own food. So you know, turn some of that lawn you have, uh, if you can, uh, into a garden. If you're not already doing that, I highly recommend it. And I think that folks like uh, John and Jared Roberts are a great inspiration. They don't have much, but a very big property, but they've turned they their backyard into a, a you know a large market garden, and they're they're feeding um, a, quite a number of families through it. I don't know if it's uh, double digits, but I think if I remember correctly, I'm telling me that they're feeding you know more than 10 other families. Uh, not necessarily all all of their their needs, but they're they're selling to a bunch of different families on a routine basis. So I think it could be inspiration on what can be done uh, by you know a single family taking action to do so. Um, John says close to double. Just type in the number. How many families are regular customers, John? Or say it over the line since it's still unmuted. Seven to eight. Okay, so you know it's a it's a good number. Um, and wh how many? How many? What's the size uh, that you're you're gardening? Um, a fifth of an acre. Fifth of an <laughs> acre, and they're feeding feeding almost ten families, um, you know, on a routine basis from that. So you can do a lot with a little. Uh, and one of the actually interesting um, factoids that Joel mentioned in one of the talks I was able to attend, he's talking about again this 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 talk on agricultural technology development. He talked about um, productivity and how organic slash biological uh, farming methods far exceed the productivity of the industrial chemical uh, farming model. He said the average backyard garden is four to five times more productive than the average industrial farm in terms of pr in productivity and output. So um, people say you can't feed the world through organic uh, farming and that kind of thing. It's a bunch of hogwash. Um, so. But just think of this. You don't necessarily think how can we support local farmers. I think it's a great solution. But 
how can we do things even more local uh, than that? So um, we're basically at our hour here, so I want to wrap it up. Does anybody else have any other questions, uh, the, the burning questions that you want to ask that we can uh, address real quick before we wrap up? Go ahead and just speak on the line if you're on. Okay. I've got a few uh, wrap-up slides here I just want to talk about. Um, one quick thing that's a good segue to my, my wrap-up. Uh, somebody emailed um, this question, to respect the farmerness of the farmer, how can we suburbanites help to relieve some of the governmental issues that plague today's farmer? A uh, fantastic question. As I mentioned earlier in referencing Kristen Canty's film, Farmageddon, farms, uh, especially small, uh, fa often family farms, are under assault. Um, it's unfortunate, but uh, it, it is the way of the world that um, you know, large corporate interests uh, generally gain control of government regulatory agencies and use them for their own benefit. And we see that with the um, small farms uh, around the country. So uh, the biggest thing I think that anybody can do um, to help with this particular issue uh, is to look at becoming a member of the Farm to Consumer Legal Defense Fund. If you've never heard of it, uh, basically it's a legal defense fund that um, it has both farmer members as well as consumer members as well as organizational members. So if you have a food co-op or buying club or some kind of organization uh, that's interested in supporting this cause, you can become a member. And uh, what they do is they, uh, as is listed here on the slide, protect the constitutional right of a uh, nation's family farms and food producers. Uh, and they also protect the constitutional right of consumers to obtain that food directly from family farms and those food producers. And then finally, um, they also are trying to protect the, the both farms and consumers from harassment by various levels of governmental interference. Um, so I highly recommend you check them out if you haven't already seen them. You go to farmtoconsumer.org and you can become a member. Uh, being a consumer member uh, is highly recommended. If you are buying from a local farmer, uh, the next time you talk to them, please, please ask if they are a farmer member of the Farm to Consumer Legal Defense Fund. And if they are not, um, give them uh, the information about it and ask them to go check it out. Uh, in my, I'm, I'm a farmer member even though I'm not really farming uh, primarily. Uh, I do occasionally sell to market, so I kind of consider it as cheap insurance. Um, but I uh, highly recommend you spread the word among um, farmers that you are, have relationships with uh, to make sure that they are taking advantage of that resource. And I highly, highly recommend that if you care about um, food freedom and the ability to get farm direct, uh, food direct from, from farmers and food producers, that you become a consumer member because all the resources um, that go into this organization and go to help um, fight the legal battles against a lot of these oppressive um, and, and really intrusive government uh, regulations and agencies. And um, we can talk more on another time. Hopefully I can get one of the um, representatives from the organization to come on and, and do a show with them. Uh, Kristen Canty is a very um, closely uh, relation, uh, related with that organization and they're helping to promote her film and use her film as a resource. But um, I'd recommend that you uh, look at becoming a member and spreading the word about that organization to other people you know that care about uh, food freedom and local food. Okay, some practical steps to wrap, wrap up here. And this kind of answers um, uh, Renee's question earlier, which are what are some ways to um, you know, get involved locally and be a food leader. Um, the first step in my mind is go as local as you can. Ultimately, the most local is doing it yourself. So grow something edible. I mean, if you live in the city and you have an apartment and you have a windowsill, get some pots and grow some herbs. Um, there's also an interesting phenomenon that's developed lately called window gardening where you actually develop um, a hanging system of, which is a uh, hydroponic system for growing herbs and other fresh uh, greens which is pretty interesting. Um, you know, if you've got a yard, uh, grow in your yard. Even if, you have, if it's mostly shaded, you can grow a lot of uh, salad crops and those kind of things uh, even in a shaded area. Um, and you can do other things uh, to help with season extension, especially if you're in an area that has you know, a short growing season like uh, the northern tier. Um, you know, greenhouses and hoop houses, those kind of things can be used. Um, secondly, uh, support your local food economy. Connect with your local farmers and buy local if you can. Um, farmers market is a great way to meet your local farmers, um, but I, I recommend you don't just stop there. Uh, 
don't become one step removed from the uh, consumer shopper mentality um, just because you go to a farmer's market. Actually go and visit the farms and see what their production is like. Get to get, have a relationship with them. Um, if they have a CSA, look at joining it. Like I said before, it's one of the best ways for consumers to support farms because you actually share in the risk of the farm uh, by providing resources up front. And um, as we just talked about, join the Farm to Consumer Legal Defense Fund which helps provide resources for uh, defending small farms against uh, uh, government uh, intrusion. Look at uh, joining a local uh, food co-op or buying club. And if you don't have one locally, um, which to, to see if you do have one locally, you're going to have to network and, and ask around. If you don't have one, look at buying one. I'm sorry, not at buying one. Look at uh, starting one. Um, not the easiest thing in the world, uh, but um, it has a lot of advantages, especially if you are looking to eat healthy, with Whole Foods and save money, often a buying club where you'll be able to buy from a co-op distributor, um, buy bulk foods and organic products um, directly, you end up uh, taking out a lot of the margin sh charged by the grocery store or wherever else you're buying it from. And um, basically you're the middleman instead of the distribution system, uh, the store where you're buying it. So that's a great way to look at um, getting access to um, some things that probably aren't available locally, some grains and other things you may not be able to buy locally. So look at doing that. Um, uh, very important is educating yourself about nutrition uh, and diet. And uh, there's some speakers we have coming up that will help us look at some of those issues. And then most importantly, uh, connect with other like-minded folks in your area. Uh, locally establish relationships with organizations or um, people in your local community and uh, talk about how you can help support the local food economy. And then beyond that, uh, connect with other like-minded folks um, elsewhere if you have relationships with other people in the country um, via Facebook or via True Food Solutions, which is one of the intents of our online community is to connect people that are like-minded. Um, those are some basic steps to uh, connect with other people. Uh, John uh, commented in we need a, uh, a regional way to do that on True Food Solutions. And, uh, I've already got that as a, uh, a feature to uh, look at developing is uh, basically a local or regional uh, fac facilitating of, of local or regional networks. So we're looking at, at how to do that uh, in the future as well. I'd say uh, in the meantime, use the tools that are there and interact with each other and uh, you know, establish the, the relationships that you have and that you can have with people and um, try to connect with other people that they may know, friends of friends that are in your area if, if possible. All right. Finally, next week uh, we're going to have on the show uh, Renee DeGroot will be our uh, webinar guest next week. Again, she blogs at culinaryreformation.com. She's the author of um, Health for Godly Generations, and we'll be talking to her about um, what real food is and how to obtain it. So we'll talk about uh, various aspects of real food, um, meat and dairy, veggies, uh, fats and oils, um, and everything else, uh, and what those are like. And she'll share a lot of the knowledge that she's gained in research and, um, and courses she's taken. And then also how to get them, which a lot of that is kind of what we just discussed, which is, you know, Grow them yourself, um, supporting local farms and small businesses, um, how to buy organically and how to buy seasonally. Um, and there are some other great things that I'm reminded uh, about you know, preserving the harvest. Um, just today my wife and my daughters were canning peaches so, uh, that we got locally. So you know, just because you don't have a peach tree or don't have, not, or not growing it yourself doesn't mean that you can't take advantage of in-season produce when it's at its most fresh and it's probably least cost. Um, and preserving the harvest to have it uh, available um, out of season. So um, obviously we're talking fresh produce, do it in season if you can, but there's a, a way to, I think, sensibly do it off season, and that would be through various means of preservation, canning, um, freezing, uh, fermenting, those kind of things. So great, uh, great talk coming up with Renee next week. Finally, just want to go over real quick um, some of the features on True Food Solutions you can use. If you haven't gone on the website already, you can register. Um, go to the, uh, the website. There's a register link on the navigation bar. 
and uh, you can register uh, on a single page sign up. Uh, we do take some information about your interests so that we can help m provide you resources. Sometimes we'll um, come across something that's of interest to um, particular um, uh, groups of, of or particular topics, and we want to focus those on people that are interested in that. So giving us as much information as possible when you sign up is helpful. Um, once you register, sign up, uh, fill out your profile, and tell others about you. You can link to other social networking profiles there, which is a great way to connect with people uh, elsewhere. Um, the, um, the main context for interacting with folks on the site is via groups, which have a whole bunch of different um, types of groups, everything from gardening and nutrition to um, local farming, um, uh, food preservation, uh, food acquisition and planning, uh, lots of different types of groups. So join some groups that are of interest to you. Um, look at the discussions there, start some discussions. Um, all of those are great. And then once you, when you interact with people in those groups, um, you know, look at the people's profile and connect with them. You can basically friend them like you do on Facebook uh, or connect with them like on LinkedIn. And it's a great way to connect with people and um, share information with each other. Um, if we have anybody that's out there that's a blogger or is considering that wants to um, actually write articles or, or share what they're doing, even if you're just you know, starting gardening and you want to share your experience, we're, we'd love to have you write for this website. Um, two different options. One, you can just be a contributor to the main uh, True Food Solutions blog if you want to be kind of a, um, a dedicated blogger. Um, we also have the option of, um, of hosting a blog for you uh, and having your blogs feed into the content on our, on our network. So um, if you are interested in writing uh, and don't currently have your own blog, um, please email me and let me know you're interested and uh, be happy to talk about how we can um, work together uh, to share your experiences with others. Uh, and make it more accessible to people. Um, and finally, our newest feature on the website is a questions and answer tool. And it's a great way for you to ask questions uh, for things that you, you know, uh, challenges you're facing, um, whether it's uh, you know, pests in your garden, whether it's the kind of questions we're asked tonight about how do you start selling to restaurants, those kind of things. Um, the tool is really uh, great because what it does is not only does it ask the question and allow for other members to contribute their experience and their insights, but allows um, other community members to vote for the answers so the best answers rise to the top over time. It's very similar to uh, tools like Yahoo Answers or Quora, if you're familiar with those, which basically allow for community voting to, to kind of identify the best, most helpful answers. And the best thing about this is it helps to, as I'm going to go here to the next uh, one here, we've actually got some giveaway contests coming up using this tool, but um, we're trying to build a knowledge base and let people contribute their insights in a way that is easily referenced later. Um, there are some great groups on Facebook where people can ask each other questions and get insights, but uh, if you've used Facebook, you know that it's kind of a really, it's like in the here and now, it, it's really hard to find anything if it's more than a couple days old. So we want to provide a long-term resource for people to find answers to questions that they have. So um, the Q&A tool is, is designed to do that. I uh, highly recommend you use it. And, um, for the past few weeks, we've had a giveaway contest using that Q&A tool uh, that actually is scheduled in tomorrow night uh, at midnight uh, Eastern Time. Uh, basically, you submit questions and answers to the questions that are there, and then vote for the best questions and then vote for the best entries. And um, the two contests we have going is uh, the first one is for the best question, so vote for your favorites. Um, vote for the questions as well as the answers. You can actually click the up arrow on the question, which gives it a vote. Um, we need that to determine a winner. And then the best contributor is participation-based. The system gives points when people vote for your question or your answer. Um, so we have a minimum threshold for the winner to be selected for that, and we're not close to it yet. So if you could please go on there and contribute uh, any questions or answers you have, and also vote for um, questions and answers that are on the site. That will help us determine the winners. We've got books and DVDs uh, of choice that will be awarded to the winners who qualify. If we don't meet the, uh, reach the minimum threshold for those contests, we'll just extend the deadline uh, probably to the end of the week. So I'd highly encourage you to go on there and participate and get a chance to win some of the great resources we have on the website uh, through this contest. And then finally, um, you, uh, I'd like to extend a special offer to all those who attended the webinar. Uh, you can get a 20% off coupon for our online store for any of the resources we have there uh, going now through Friday night, uh, August 3rd. Um, use the code FOODLEADER at checkout to get that 20% discount. 
And again, don't forget to participate in the Q&A giveaway because if you win, then you can get some of those resources for free. We are doing a book uh, and or DVD of your choice. And um, to get the uh, information on that, um, check it out on our blog. I'll send a follow-up email that gives the details of those. But um, the, uh, the Best Contributor Award actually is going to get um, three DVDs of their choice, a uh, digital book, and a, and a print book. So there's a pretty good price pack there for the Best Contributor. So I highly encourage you to participate uh, with that uh, giveaway contest, which are scheduled to end tomorrow night. Uh, finally, please like and share uh, our Facebook page. Uh, follow us on Twitter. If you're on Google+, we have a Google Plus page as well. Um, those have been in the emails that you've been getting. If you, for some reason, uh, joined us, uh, joined the webinar from Facebook, and you're not on our email subscription list yet, uh, please go to the website and sign up on the email list, um, and uh, you'll get uh, the links to those profiles on the website as well. So look forward to interacting with you. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We appreciate your time and your input, and I uh, really appreciate the interaction. Uh, thanks so much for joining us, and uh, we'll send a follow-up uh, link to the webinar replay uh, so you can share with your friends that weren't able to make it, and uh, they can enjoy the conversation as well. We'll be having these Monday night at 9 p.m. Eastern Time uh, weekly for the next uh, uh, at least month or two. So look forward to having you join us in a future session. Thank you so much for your time, and uh, have a great night. You are now muted.